Did you see the... Okay, good evening everybody. I hope you are all safe, healthy and well in these challenging times. Uh, my name is Keen O'Neill and my role here this evening is to give you a brief introduction to our education programs in the Department of Sport, Leisure and Childhood Studies, i.e. our BA in Early Childhood Education and Care and our BA at Honours in Montessori Education. I have some colleagues from the department, Marion Quinn, who's one of our leading lecturers in the education space within the department and on a national and international level, and also graduates of our Early Childhood Education and Care program, Catherine, and from our Montessori program, Joanna. So just before I kick into the proceedings, just a couple of small, um, if you want to call them housekeeping matters. First and foremost, to a dear to the public health guidelines. There are contact tracing forms in every table. If we could just ask you to fill in those just to make sure that we are fulfilling our obligations in the context of uh, public health during COVID-19. Second of all, if you're not drinking or eating or snacking, if you wouldn't mind keeping your masks on, um, just to make sure we're trying to keep ourselves as healthy and safe, not only for ourselves, but for everyone else in the room. Naturally, if you're snacking or drinking, that's perfectly fine to keep them down. Just the last thing I would say then is we have two major exits to the building. Um, we haven't got a full house tonight, so I don't anticipate that being a huge issue. Um, but if we do need to exit this room for whatever reason, there is one major exit on my right, and then one at the back of the room turning left. I feel like an air steward doing that. Um, so let's get down to proceedings. I'm just conscious that there are a lot of people at home uh, watching this through a live stream, and you're all very, very welcome here this evening as well. And we'll spend the next 20 to 25 minutes working our way through the programs, the program offerings, the program backgrounds, and I think most interesting of all, hearing the thoughts of our graduates of both programs and the high-level expertise that Marion brings to the education suite of programs in the department. So, first things first, as you can see from the screen behind me, just a very brief presentation. Our two major programs are MT572, that's the new MTU code for our Level 7 Bachelor of Arts in Early Childhood Education and Care, and MT970, which is our new MTU code for our Bachelor of Education in Montessori Education. I have an asterisk just on the third row down below there, and that is the one-year add-on to our Level 7 Early Childhood Education and Care program. So, on average, 90 to 95% of our students, when they complete their three-year Level 7 program, they automatically progress, provided they get 50% across the board. Um, they're all very high achievers on our education programs, so they are, but as soon as they do, nearly everyone goes forward to their Level 8 program, and that's why I included it there for you. So, just in terms of the Early Childhood Education and Care program, as you can see, it provides specialized training, support, advice, and information on best practice for the education and care of young children from birth to six years of age. And this is with a specific view of supporting the development of the early childhood education and care workforce. And Marion will speak to that later on after the presentation. Essentially, when we speak of early childhood education and care, which is slightly different to the Montessori program we'll come on to shortly, we're focusing on a child cohort, a child population from birth to six years. In terms of the thematic domains, for want of a better term, the program is structured into big rocks, essentially. And these are themes that are repetitive and are scaffolded almost in a hierarchical order from fundamental to intermediate to advanced level throughout the four years. And these big rocks essentially are the education or the pedagogy side of the program, the psychology and health 
side of the program, we have a socio-cultural angle. And you can see the types of modules underneath all of these without going into them. And then we also have a huge emphasis on the creative arts in our program. Probably one of the key defining features of the Early Childhood Education and Care program at MTU Cork. And the reason I say that is we dedicate over 30 credits across the three years of study to focusing on the role and impact of music, art, and drama in fostering the development of young children. We have specialized staff from a music background, an art background, a drama background, and every year there's a double-weighted module, 10 credits, that focuses on that space. It really is one of the defining features of our program, as is the whole applied nature of it, how we focus on outdoor learning, physical activity, health, well-being, in addition to the theoretical modules. Placement is the second core defining feature of this program. We offer two full semesters. So out of the three years, two semesters per year, two of those six semesters, our students are in the workforce. They're on placement, professional work placement, at the coalface, in early year centers, neenery, creches, all over Cork, and in some cases all over the country, depending on where our students are coming from. So this is a huge, huge feature. A third of our program is not stuck in a classroom or a lab or in an outdoor activity. It's actually at the coalface, working with professional, qualified early childhood education and care specialists. And the reason we feel that's important is because it gives our students an opportunity to integrate the theory that they learn here in Bishopstown with the practice that they need to become the best specialists and practitioners they can be. All the time working with a mentor on site, but also working with mentors, educational mentors from our own program. Huge part of our program. In terms of the employment opportunities, they can range from what might seem the most obvious, an EC, EC practitioner working in centres in Ireland or abroad, extending potentially into a management role, particularly for those students who complete their level eight studies. That's the year one add-on in year four. Some students might diversify. They might have an interest in adapted physical activity, in working with children with additional needs, and they might end up as a development worker, they might end up in a family or community center, using the skill set and the expertise that they attained here in um, MTU Cork. So this is something you can see quite clearly online. I'm, I'm not going to dwell on it, but it just gives you an idea, an indication of the laddered effect of the actual program. And as you can see here, the pointer won't work in a reflective screen. In semester three, quite clearly, there is only one large 30 credit module. That full semester in the autumn of year two, you're in the workforce. You come back then, you do some more study, some more development of your own practice, of your own education in the space. And in the second semester of year three, you're back out again. And we also link in a business management type module when you are out there in centers so we can bring your business acumen, your management expertise into the workforce. So not only are you an early childhood education and care practitioner, but you're also thinking as an entrepreneur as well. Okay, and we like to think that that balance, the breadth within the program, makes our graduates as robust and as work ready as they possibly can. Placement is huge, but also is the focus we put on exploring specific areas that our students in year four and the BA Honours program have in the research area. So we have a research skills module in semester one or fourth year, and then a 10 credit module in a dissertation. For those that don't know, a dissertation is a deep dive into an area of interest you may have. It may be working with young children from a physical activity perspective. It may be working with children from disadvantaged backgrounds or exploring the work of children from disadvantaged backgrounds. It could be something very educational focused in terms of curriculum, but it gives you an opportunity to really delve into a specific area in great detail. And that sums up our early childhood education and care program. So I'll just segue nicely into Montessori education and the conversation shortly will be what what is the difference between the two? We will come to that. But the aim of our Montessori program, folks, is to provide students with a comprehensive understanding of the Montessori approach to the education and care of children in early and middle childhood. So now we're extending that birth to six. 
up to 12 years of age. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Once again, we try to provide breadth as well as depth in terms of the learning on this program. It's very similar in how we design the program because we really do feel that there are so many bases that we need to cover in detail when working with the children of our nation. And as you can see here, these are just some flavors. We have the pedagogy, which is teaching students how to teach, how to be effective teachers. We have inclusion, we've talked on that already, child development, health and physical activity. Because we have sports programs in our department, we're able to use some of our physical activity specialists to come on board and deliver those type of modules with our education specialists as well. So it's a nice kind of relationship we have across the department. You can also see at the bottom in the middle there, there is a management stream in this program as well. Because not only do we want our graduates to be educationalists, we also want them to be able to forage their own pathway into not just working in a center, but why not running one? Why not managing one? Maybe why not own one? And that's the focus we take on the program. Very similar from a placement perspective, we focus on the two semesters and we put the same emphasis into the Montessori education program as we do into the ECEC program. We have a workplace mentor, we have a university mentor, and we have that triad of communication, of lessons learned, of feedback, of evaluation. Coming to the end, you can see once again the employment opportunities. These are a little bit more extensive in terms of the age range because yes, our Montessori graduates have expertise from birth to six, but also, as you can see, we're using SAC, that's school age childcare. Okay, so we're into the primary school curriculum age here. They have that expertise and that ability to work in these type of centers all over the country and abroad. Very similar in design. Again, you can see where the placement resides. The difference with Montessori education from a structural um, perspective is this is a level eight ab initio program. So what that means is that you come in in first year and you know you're on a four-year program. That's your pathway right the way through. In terms of the early childhood education and care program, slightly different, it's a three-year level seven, and then you choose whether you want to progress on to level eight. So I hope I'm being clear in that regard. We also have to focus on, um, on the placement piece in year four, and that comes to the end of the brief presentation. That was just a whistle-stop tour, but I guess the real focus now is listening to the experts in that space. Um, and their experiences on the program itself. Thank you. Right, Catherine, I'll come to you first if you don't mind. Um, Catherine is a graduate of our program Level 7 and Level 8, and it would be great if you could just give the audience a bit of a background of your kind of decision-making around why you chose early childhood education and care, specifically why here in MTU, um, and how you feel it's developed you as a person and a professional. That's, that's a big question, but uh, take it away. <laughs> I'll try to break it down. So thank you, Keen, for inviting me here this evening. Um, it's a pleasure. So my name is Catherine Corcoran. I am a postgraduate student and a PhD candidate in the Department of Sport, Leisure and Childhood Studies, where I'm also a part-time postgraduate lecturer. So my journey began here in 2016 when I enrolled in the Early Childhood Education and Care Programme. And my experience has been incredibly positive and that's attributed to a number of different factors. And I suppose initially why I chose MTU was because that the course is a multidisciplinary programme. So students can really engage in a, a vast range of modules covering all salient areas of early childhood education and care. So spanning from psychology modules, holistic health, down to child law and early legislation, um, legislation and down to the practical modules then of creative arts, pedagogy, outdoor learning, physical activity. So real depth, great depth and scope to the course like you mentioned there in your introduction, Kian. I suppose another factor for me personally was the, the nature of the lectures. I found the lectures here to be incredibly supportive. I think they're very intuitive of the students needs and abilities and I think not only do the lectures here help you to excel in a professional capacity, but also really nurture your personal development and your holistic well-being, I suppose. So for me, that really is the essence of why this program is so successful and why a lot of students 
you know, find it so fulfilling and enjoyable, which I can testify to. So how has this helped me um, and where I am today? I suppose, again, it's very difficult to narrow down, but off the top of my head, it's, it's worth noting that when I engaged in professional placement that I actually secured um, an employment opportunity in a community-based setting. And this was through networking with the ECEC service providers, um, management, and the ECEC practitioners. So when I was working on the ground at the coalface, I really drew on the immense knowledge that I received across all the interdisciplinary domains that we studied during the programme. And this really stood to me. So applying that knowledge to practice and having that theoretical underpinning of your practice. So that allowed me then to implement developmentally appropriate learning opportunities for the children, yeah. which is extremely beneficial for their holistic development. So then I would have also utilise the knowledge that I learned in the practical based modules so for instance, the creative arts, um, outdoor learning, physical activity, so that children were constantly being provided with enriching and meaningful experiences. And of course, then your practice is underpinned by policy, by guiding frameworks like Astra and Chilta, or National Quality and Curriculum Framework, which is an integral component of an ECEC practitioner role. So I suppose it really helped me in that sense. And also, this program integrates different extracurricular activities and events where students can really enhance their personal and professional development. So for example, in 2018 and 2019, I volunteered here at the National OMEP conference, which was held here at MTU. And this really allowed me to network with academics and scholars in the field. And as a result, I was invited on the National OMEP Committee of Ireland, where we actively strive to create better outcomes for children and to raise the profile of the ECEC profession as a whole. So an incredibly positive experience on account of me being involved in this programme. So again, then just moving on to, I suppose, where all of this has led me to now, it's played an integral part in the work that I do now and the research that I'm now conducting. And just to give you a bit of context, when I initially um, enrolled in this course, I thought that I might work in the sector, of course, or go on and maybe do primary school teaching. But it was when I engaged in the psychology-based modules, in particular, holistic health, um, I was introduced to a wonderfully inspiring lecturer, Dr. Judith Butler. And Judith introduced us to this concept of childhood trauma and adverse childhood experiences and that when children experience trauma in the early years of life and those sensitive developmental periods that it can have negative consequences throughout their lifespan. So that immediately captivated my attention and it was an area that I became deeply interested and invested in throughout these modules. So when it came to my final year dissertation, small scale research study, I was under the supervision of Dr. Judah Butler and we worked very closely to investigate stakeholders' understanding of trauma-informed practice. And what emerged and what we concluded was that the ECEC profession lack adequate resources to deliver trauma-informed practice and that this sector is in need of reform. So it was here that Judith suggested or encouraged me to take this research further to postgraduate level. And this brings me full circle key into what I mentioned earlier about how the lectures are really invested in the students. They're really student focused and student centered. And again, raising, um, allowing you to reach your, your full potential. And I suppose that's what the, the undergraduate did for me and led me to where I am now. And I think it's worth noting that I've, this is my sixth year now um, studying in this department. And as I mentioned at the start, I'm lucky enough to pursue a couple of hours lecturing on this programme. So I've really seen this programme through every lens at undergraduate level, postgraduate level now as a lecturer, having that perspective. And I can really testify to the fact that this programme is an excellent programme. Um, I would actively encourage anyone with an interest in early childhood education and care to maybe do a bit more research or to enrol. And, you know, the fact that it is a multidisciplinary programme, I have friends who have gone on to engage in social policy, who've done a higher diploma in special education, some are teaching in Dubai, some have done primary teaching, some are working in the sector. So again, there's a lot of doors that can be opened for you in terms of employment um, okay. prospects. So. Yeah, really positive experience overall. Did you get all that? <laughs> Fant <laughs> Fantastic, Catherine. Fant absolutely. And it was really a big question, but you gave an even bigger answer.
Um, Marion, we've touched on the research side of things in the dissertations, but everyone who speaks of our program also speaks about the emphasis we place on professional work placement and practice. Um, and you were at the cold face of this, not just within the department, but at national level as well, on a lot of government um, bodies and consortia. Before we move on to the Montessori piece, because placement works between both programs, could you just give the audience a bit of a background as to why placement is so important for the development of our students and linking that application of theory to practice? Um, okay, um, hello everybody, um, thanks very much for coming. Um, so in relation to placement, actually I was just running over here because um, I was on, on a video call with one of the students who's out on placement at the moment, um, and it was absolutely fantastic. I mean, the smile on her face. Now, obviously there'd be a smile on their face when they come into our class as well because they're so excited to see us. Um, <laughs> the smile on their face in terms of engaging with the children, um, and this particular student has spent six weeks already out there. She was working with preschool children. She goes, oh, they're brilliant they're amazing, they're so funny, they're creative. You know, you just never know what's going to happen. Anybody who's, anybody who's around children, you know, you, I mean, you get to see that and experience it on a regular basis. But anyway, her second block of placement, she was going to be working with babies and toddlers. Now, the last conversation I had with her a couple of weeks ago was, I'm not sure if I want to work with babies and toddlers. You know, what do they do, you know? Um, they lie there, they sleep, they, you know, not a whole lot more. Um, and uh, so anyway, I said, well, how's it going? Um, well, the smile on her face, she goes, this is even better than the last one, all right? Loved both settings and learning so much about the children in terms of how they engage, um, you know, how they're developmentally changing day by day and just being able to see that and being able to experience it and see how each day changes the child and the impact that they can have on it. Um, so one thing that struck me actually, she said, God, do you know what, this is a really special job. And I said, it is, I've been telling you that for how many years. But the seeing it on placement is where they really believe it. Because it puts together all that we've spoken to them about across all of the multidisciplinary um, modules that they've engaged with, all that we've told them, now they can see it in action. And they come back and go, oh yeah, what you said, that was right. I can see it now. Um, and it's brilliant then, I suppose, you know, I suppose seeing our students where they bring the skills, um, the competencies and the understanding, um, you know, and um, from, from their learning here in college, they bring it into the placement. Um, and it transforms the placement as well, because obviously the educators who are out in the services, they learn from the students in terms of, you know, who bring different and um, diverse ideas. And then our students come back into us again. And then they step it up another level because they bring that knowledge that they've got from the profession, from working with the children, working with the teams, seeing what is the reality of working in early year services. They bring it back to the next lot of modules that they engage with, with us. And, and then we scaffold their learning further, but now they've got a very solid picture of the child. They can see and they can it project the image of a baby of a toddler, of a preschooler, um, you know, of a child with a particular additional needs, with children in, in an after-school setting, if they choose that option of a placement. Um, but they have to work with the babies and toddlers, and they have to work with the preschoolers, because it is a program for, for birth to six. Um, so all of those experiences make it live and make it real for them. Uh, and as Catherine identified, it also makes you see, is there a particular area that I'm totally, you know, kind of drawn to? And it could be the practice of working in services. And I mean, I spent 20 years working in services, so I love it when they say they're staying in the services. But I also love it when they see a particular aspect and go, do you know what, I worked with a child and they were really struggling with their speech. I think I want to go into speech and drama. And I think I want to support the children at that level. Absolutely brilliant that they do so. And they've got that opportunity of going on doing it. But it'll very often be what they see in the, place, in the practice placement and, the, and what they're supported in learning um, between the college and our, our partners in the early year services um, that brings them to, the, to that realization and brings them to kind of go, do you know what? This is a job that has significant meaning in life. It's transformative because they're going to be either working directly with the children or they're going to be involved in research or support agencies about supporting the people who work with children, which is ultimately about supporting children. So um, I'm absolutely mad about the placement, as you can see, <laughs> and I think it's a hugely important part in both our programs. <coughs> There's a reason Marion is the placement coordinator in our department. It just oozes, oozes out of her. Um, Joanna, it's never easy being asked the last question as such. 
and you had an interesting pathway, so I'm going to do a bit of reverse engineering here. So before you came back into your level eight studies, um, you were a practitioner in the field for years, you worked in a center, you owned and managed your own center, and then you came back into the educational piece at level eight. So can you just tell us a little bit about the Montessori program and how it helped you to bridge the theory with the practice that you were so au fait with having ran and owned your own center? Thank you, Keen. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Keen, for reminding me that I came out here as a mature student. <laughs> it's always lovely to be reminded about that. Um, so similar to Catherine, I came out here in 2016. And what was really, really significant for me at that time was I had completed my level seven Montessori degree in 1999. So I came out as a very, very mature student. And I'm sure you can appreciate it's not always maybe the easiest thing to come back to study after such a long time. So for me, I was very much aware of Marion Quinn and you know just the emphasis on education in CIT, which it was at that time. So it was really very simple for me to come out here. And I have to say, it was a seamless transition in returning as a student, which I really didn't think it would be. Um, because as Keen had said, I was used to running and operating my own business, which I still had at that time. I was a boss, so I was an employer. I had an awful lot of responsibilities, but yet I was returning here as a student. So, you know, I took on a new role. And what was significant in returning as a student was, first of all, the variety within the modules. Secondly, it was the crossover in the modules. I love seeing how the modules connected, but most importantly for me, because I was still running my own service, was how significant and how current the content of the modules were. Um, and as I'm sure you can appreciate, that is what's significant when you are working in the sector, that the learning is occurring in the colleges, that it is current and it is relative to what's needed in the settings. Um, then I think it was just the broad, the depth and the range of modules as well, Keen, which really appealed to me. And as you already mentioned, in relation to enterprise, that was really significant for me, as you know. And I loved seeing that module being present and I've been very fortunate to be invited to speak to in that module a number of times, which is um, delivered by Jonathan Place. So again, it's important to see that that module is there, that it's accessible to everyone, and it just gives you a taste, even just to think about, would I like to own a service? You know, it just sets the seed, which that, for me, is what MTU does. It sets the seed. Anybody can achieve. There's learning for everyone, and there's a pathway for everyone. And I think that, for me, kind of sums it up. Also, I'm very fortunate to be on the placement team, which I love as well, and I'm on the placement team of the Early Childhood Education and Care and the Montessori programs. And again, having been in the settings, I love being able to listen to the students and hear their stories. And it's great to see, like as Marion said, the excitement in their faces, but also just the things that they see, and then how you're related and connected. And I always say it's a little bit like joining the dots. So I think it's very fortunate for the students to have um, just that skill set on the placement team that we can, you know, liaise with them, we can support them, which we do. And similar to Marion, I mean, the support that students get is immense. You know, they're, at the moment it is online, but however, we are very, very available to students. And I think the other thing that I just would like to bring in what I was thinking about today was, you know, I suppose there are so many different supports available to students, and I know you can see some of the... Um, you know, the, some of them are advertised down there, but there's also the career service, which might not be advertised down there, and that's a very significant one, which it has been for me, because again, it has helped me immensely, just in updating the CV, and just the simple things that are important to keep on top of. Sure, and without question, MTU really puts a large emphasis on lifelong learning and career development. We really take pride in the work ready, career-focused nature of our programs. Um, so I'm glad you brought that point up, Joanna. Marion, there are just two key things. I'm conscious of time. We have one minute on the clock, and I see my colleagues from Applied Social Studies over there. Um, two questions that came up during the week. Um, if you wouldn't mind taking the first, I'll finish with the second. It's the obvious one, and there's no one better place than you to answer this. What are the differences, if any, between early childhood education and care and Montessori education? Because it is a decision that prospective students would have to make, and it's important that they're aware of what are those differences that might make them lean more towards one program than another. Yeah, okay. Um, so, so, I mean, there's a huge amount of similarities, uh, you know, in terms of the both uh, cross um, multidisciplinary um, uh, 
programs. Um, the significant difference is one is from birth to six, and um, the other is from birth to 12. And um, so while the students in on the early years program, they don't um, go into the primary schools, uh, the students in the Montessori program do so they can see you know, what's going on for children, and <coughs> excuse me, um, for children at those ages and stages. And um, it also, um, I suppose, kind of a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of school age childcare, so working in after school services, um, there's qualification requirements impending for that. They're not there just yet, but they're going to be introduced within the next year or so. Um, there's a new workforce development plan going to be announced in relation to that. Um, and I suppose, so our, our graduates of the Montessori program will have qualification up as far as 12 years of age, so they will be qualified to work with 12, you know, um, children up to that age as well. Um, so I suppose, and the other thing is, um, obviously the Montessori students get a, a deep dive in terms of a pedagogical approach, which is very child-centered. Um, and while we, in, while on that program, they engage with um, learning about other types um, of, of, of pedagogies, ways of interacting with children, um, they have one deep dive. Uh, in, in the early years program, they cover um, a, a lot of different um, pedagogies and way, ways to work, but it's a more generalist approach. Um, so I suppose they're the two significant differences, but they're both fantastic programs. <laughs> Thanks, Marion. I hope that's clear to everybody. And once again, Marion and I are always accessible via email or phone call if you wanted to follow up particularly on that, uh, on that query that comes our way. Just to wrap it up, folks, um, there's one point that constantly comes my way um, when parents or students or guidance counselors call, comes to Marion all the time, and it relates to primary school teaching, primary education. How do the programs link? Um, so it is important to know there are no direct links between the two insofar as that there are no guaranteed pathways into a master's in primary education. However, because of the nature of our programs, the robust nature, the practical, the theory-based aspects, our graduates do tend to favor quite strongly when they apply for those programs. We don't deliver early childhood education and care and Montessori education programs so that our graduates can go on and become primary school teachers, but some of them want to, and that's simply how it is. So although there's no emphasis on it across both programs, you're in a very strong position if that's your passion at the end of your four years and you think that that's the route you want to go. So I know that's a question that uh, comes our way very, very often. So thank you so much for your time, folks. I really appreciate your attention and the questions that have come in during the week. Thanks to Catherine, to Marion and Joanna. Um, and if anyone has any further questions, feel free to contact us in the Sport, Leisure and Childhood Studies Department. Um, Tom and colleagues from Applied Social Studies are up next. There's just a short video that's gonna serve as an interlude before um, social care work and community development will be introduced then. Thank you very much, everybody, and safe home tonight. Thank you. MTU prides itself on being a student-centred university. The close and tight-knit community that we have today really makes it personal to every single student. MTU really does push the boundaries on being as student-centred as possible. Within the Students' Union, we are here to provide a voice for students. We run a number of campaigns throughout the year. Within MTU, there's a number of sports and societies. So we have a number of sports clubs from soccer, football, hurling, etc. And societies is another kind of thing where students can meet like-minded people, people with the same interests, and have a kind of a social aspect as well. MTU, I believe, has students at its heart. One of the mantras we have in student affairs is the voice of the student must always be heard. And for us, that's very, very important that we listen to the student, we listen to what they're looking for, we listen to their changing needs, and we develop our services and grow our services around those various needs. We prepare students to be work ready and also to be life ready as civic minded graduates. Throughout their journey with us, we, we support them in many different ways. We support them in their health and well-being so that they can fully engage with their programmes as well as supporting them academically. And we're very much student centred in that we want our students to reach their full potential and to flourish. Just want to make sure that's working properly. <laughs> um, my name is Tom O'Connor, uh, Head of the Department of Applied Social Studies. Um, I'm just going to take you through some slides on, 
information really on the courses that we have to offer at CAO level, which are community care work, sorry, social care work and community development. And I, then we're going to have to come more interesting people, the, the actual graduates of the programs, uh, to talk to them after that. Okay, so I, this, you can see, you can get a lot of this stuff in the manuals and online as well. If, and, you know, so there's no, you don't have to remember it all, but this is just a background. So the, the course is uh, Social Care Work, which is, I suppose, our flagship program in Applied Social Studies. Very popular course, very diverse course, a lot of opportunities at the end of it, a lot of pathways. People go off and become guards, they go off and become primary school teachers, they become family support workers. We look at all that in a minute. But it's a very good one in terms of uh, large numbers of applications. Every year it's very popular, basically because it's, so, so it's got such a mix and it's, it's so versatile and there's a huge emphasis on work-ready job placement in it. So the Irish there is Obrachorum Hoshilta, application by the CAO, I won't go through all. Now, the level seven in this case is, the, is, the, is D1 to actually apply for. We do have an add-on honours degree, uh, but it's the level seven Koru, which is the regulatory body, which will be rolling out registration uh, next year across the country uh, regulates social work, it regulates a lot of other caring professions, biochemists and so forth, uh, social work has been regulated for years, and it's the level seven is the qualification that they recognize, not the level eight, which is interesting because they wanted to get a common, a common program across all colleges for recognition. Um, okay, it's three years, and we're in Bish the Bishopstone campus, uh, so as I just put down at the end there, it's the level, the level seven is the, is the Koru registration standard. Um, okay, what is social care work? Um, you can have 120 definitions. If you look at 120 textbooks, no, no one will say the same. It's basically caring for people who are, who are in need of care. The easiest way to understand it is, we look at it in a minute, is what type of client groups Clients is a phrase that's used often in social care service users is another word, word uh, to describe. Like we're talking about older people, we're talking about intellectually disabled people, physically disabled people, homeless people, um, at risk youth, various other categories of people who need care. Um, so it's, it's, it's working in an empathetic way, in a practical way, doing the hands-on stuff, designing care plans for people, bringing them on outings, you're looking after their their needs, their psychosocial needs, their physical needs, the whole holistic model of, of, of social care and health, really. The common question I would put in there is, what's the difference between a social care worker and a social worker? The social worker is somebody, really, who, who, who's kind of a client services manager, kind of, in, in many ways, a person who keeps a file on somebody who organises things. The social care worker is the person on the ground who does who does the hands-on delivery of care on a daily basis. Social care workers uh, work alongside social workers. Social workers will come in and there might be a, uh, somebody, there might be a family referred to the, to the social work service and then a team of care workers would, might, which might include mental health service professionals, social care workers and family support workers would be, would be part of a holistic care pl plan for these people to actually help them out or in an in intellectual disability setting. The social care workers are the people who actually would use picture exchange communication systems to communicate with clients to make sure that they get proper quality of life interventions, proper services, proper um, um, therapies of whatever type they need. So it's now, so the social care worker is the more hands-on person. Increasingly though, the lines are blurring because there's, there's, there's great demand for both professions, but the social, a lot of the time social care workers are doing very, very um, significant work uh, almost similar in many ways to social work, but and just like social work, social work has been registered as a profession with that kind of professional kudos for the last number of decades, probably since the Second World War, before the Second World War in the UK, social care work is, is coming on stream and being registered as well now, so it's kind of, it's an up and coming profession as time goes on. Uh, Examples of jobs you get working in there. We, we look at that in a second because I'll, I'll show you the, the list of things. Um, and, and we look at the work experience. The placement is an integral part of the course. Um, you know, it, it, there's a lot of theory, policy, knowledge, integration of knowledge, interdisciplinarity in the course. But we actually, uh, it, it, the practical placement is actually very important. 
So these are just the, the, the entrance requirements. I, I won't spend too much time with it because they're in the manual. You know, people generally have a leave, people have to have five subjects um, at O6 or H7, maths at O6 or H7, English or Irish at O6 or H7, and then the necessary points. Last year, the points were 360. Um, they had risen significantly from the previous year. There was a large number of applications. I expect there'd be a large number of applications this year. So I wouldn't necessarily expect points to drop. So I would say that would be, you know, you know, it, 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 for a level seven course, it's quite a high points course, basically. Uh, Garda vetting is mandatory. And just I put in there at the end, your personal and social, I don't, I don't want to make it sound as if it's all just that anyone is suited to social care. Because you, they're not necessarily, you, you have to have, you, really, you have to be interested in caring for people, really. You have to have those values, those beliefs, that sort of uh, value system that you want to help and you want to change things and you, you, you know, you, that's part of who you are. What Sarah Banks, who's professor of social care in Durham University calls a calling to care. They used to be a thing called a calling to nursing years ago, you know, where, you know, where people had got a tendency to want to care in nursing, that kind of thing really is, is big in social care as well. This is just some blurb here from the, about Koru. Koru, we're in the process of, get, uh, of we've made our application for, for validation under Koru. We'll be getting our visit in April. All going well, we'll have our registration for next September. Uh, but Koru require, and we've always been doing it anyway, 800 hours of practic practice placement over a minimum of two years. Uh, so we generally have placements in first, second, and third year, but over a minimum of two years. Um, uh, so placements are key to this course. Social care service users, just going back to what I said, I point out some job areas, you know, and there's a huge, there's a big demand for care at the moment. Actually, there's a shortage of social care workers. Um, and it's, you know, it's becoming quite chronic as well. And we get a lot of, we get a lot of emails and I get a lot of emails and people wanted to come in to talk to students, to, you know, it's a growth area. It's also part of the aging population. When elder care, there's you know there's a growth for that area, but there's a great for you know Ireland used to have the kind of and you see you, you would have seen it in the program about the chewing babies and other things. Ireland you has a fairly shameful history in terms of, of care, looking after people, disabled people, um, uh, uh, children outside born outside of wedlock, and that has all changed to the point where service users' rights and HICWA national standards have come in and proper care services which conform to proper standards are now having to be delivered, care plans, inspections, and stuff like that. So the demand for qualified social care workers who actually know exactly what they're doing is growing all the time, and, and, and basically there's not enough out there to meet the demand at the moment. So these are the type of services, intellectual or physically disabled, family support, elder care, youth at risk, homeless people, health and wellness services. Most of this is going becoming an integrated care, integration of health and social care in the community, Moving out of residential and institutional care is the big model under, under health policy or health and social care policy, uh, and then located in the home in the community or residential. Uh, so community development then uh, for Bert Pubble uh, is also a level seven qualification. Just like social care, it's got three years duration. And in this case, obviously it's located on the Bishopstown campus. Um, so what's community development, you ask yourself? Well, community development is one model, really, if you look at it in, from the literature within community work. It's working in the community. You could be working alongside social care workers. You could be working alongside occupation therapists. You could be working alongside uh, home, you know, homeless executives, homeless support workers, you know, child care workers, whatever. Community, the, the difference with the community development is that community development is about empowering people in community development groups, like family resource centres, like community development projects, local development projects, particularly in rural areas or in the cities, you know, where people are actually joining groups and actually trying to make their own areas better. Um, that in the local area, that's one, that's one uh, particular type. The other one is in communities of interest. So you'd have a lot of, commu the idea here is social justice and empowerment. And empowerment means getting power for the people who actually are affected or marginalized or need services or, uh, so Conrad will be talking about the LGBTQI community, which is the uh, uh, which is what in community work slash community development is called a community of interest or traveller support groups, 
or women's groups, women's community work, rural development, community work, these are all areas uh, that, that are there. Um, entrance requirements, five leaving cert subjects at 06H7, English or Irish at 06H7, no maths. Similar to social care, um, guard vetting is a requirement for both courses. And the points were quite a lot lower in this course uh, because the numbers aren't as high, the applications aren't as high. Um, and the points were 133 in the last academic year. Uh, the learners and pathways, a lot, of, a lot of learners that come into the community development have a particular interest in actually getting involved in a group, in a community development group, in second chance learning, in uh, their local community, in whatever particular cause or whatever they wish to actually be immersed in. Um, and, and I learned that as they could become, you know, we often had engineers or other people deciding to apply for either community development or social good, they just want a career change. And they, they believe that they want to do something completely different. Um, and they may have a particular passion or interest in, in a social group, well, as I've said, and we'll talk to the panelists about this in a second. Um, okay, and in, some, in, in terms of uh, progressions and pathways, Many of the uh, social or the community development level seven students can actually apply for the honours degree level eight in social care, even though the level seven is the actual core registration, but they can still get the honours degree in social care add-on, which then opens up other possibilities as well in the labour market, but also particularly in postgraduate study. Um, so um, uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, we'll just open up the, uh, some panel discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Kate Dolan Crowley, who is uh, a Level 7 graduate of social care work, and Conrad Eam, who is a Level 7 graduate of community development, and get a bit of uh, more interesting stuff going here <laughs> than just listening to, m to me uh, garbling on a bit. Uh, Kate, you might just tell us about your reason, like we were talking about the calling to care, and why, why you'd want to do social care, and how it fitted your personality and your aims and ambitions in life, and just tell us a bit about that, maybe. Um, so for me, um, I was always around people with disabilities. I have a cousin who has a physical disability, and I was always fascinated about all his physio and things he... All, he'd have a multidisciplinary team, and who was on his team, um, and my dad also coached a Special Olympics team for soccer, so I was around people with intellectual disabilities as well. So I always found it fascinating, and I was just there, like, I genuinely always felt these people were superhumans. And I still think that these people are superhumans, they're just underestimated. And even me, currently, I still underestimate some of my, some of my service users, and then they come out and absolutely amaze me, and I'm like, why did I underestimate me? Why did I underestimate them? But it's so common, and I just really wanted to, like, make people realize that these are superhumans and they're just underestimated and you know just to be able to give them the opportunity and empower them to be able to be like no I can do it so that's kind of the reason why I decided I want to do it anyway. Thanks very much Kate I just asked Conrad the same reason um, for the so same question I should say. <laughs> Sorry. For me I came back as a mature student before that I suppose I had a completely different kind of line of work. So I was doing costumes for the Opera House for six years, and then I entered Mr. Gay Cork and got Mr. Gay Ireland then as well. And then I started volunteering with different uh, LGBT organizations, and like the Gay Project and Sexual Health Center, and as well with St. Vincent de Paul. Um, and then I suppose through the late Dave Roach, he inspired me then to kind of look more into community development. So I decided to come back to college. Um, so my friend had previously done the community development course, uh, Stephanie, and she kind of gave me a rough rundown of what to expect and stuff. Um, so just being involved in different communities and being LGBT myself, community development really kind of spoke to me. Um, and I'm kind of progressing now afterwards as well. Yeah, and Conrad is your is your gold standard community development worker. Actually, some people might even have seen him on TV the other night. He, he's at the Man Nation. I don't know how many times he's a bit of a TV star at this stage. Um, Conrad is involved in um, tidy towns out in Ballyfehan. He's involved in LGBTQI. He's involved in uh, amateur theatre, um, 
rapping, I think, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, he's just an all-around guy, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I like uh, to keep busy. <laughs> Yeah, you certainly do that, all right. Uh, and um, we'll just return to Kate. Um, what, how do you find the placement uh, uh, in social care, the work experience, and the, the, trying to uh, trying to do the kind of academic side of it as well? Or you might make some comments on what's good, bad, or indifferent, or whatever. So for me, what the most important part of this course for me was the placement, because the social care work, no, by the way. Yeah, social care. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because. Realistically, if you had, let's say, a grandparent in a nursing home, would you hire, if you, would you want someone that had the experience already, that has been supervised inside minding them? Or would you like someone that just, you know, did whatever degree and had no placement? So that's why I chose this course for me, was because I'm more, first of all, I'm more employable. And second of all, I feel more competent in my own skills because I have been taught these by, and been supervised by people who've been working in this sector for years. Um, I'm, so the placement for me is, was the highlight of my, um, time, my time in college. My first year placement, I went to a youth cafe, um, which would be kind of done a lot with community work as well, I presume. <laughs> um, and my second year placement was in co-foundation, supporting people with intellectual disabilities in a training centre where they learn independent skills so they'll be able to live in them, their own houses and do things by themselves. But my third year placement um, was replaced with virtual placement because of the pandemic. But with that, um, because I didn't have placement, I went and applied for an inte intellectual disability organization where I currently work as a relief worker. So that means if people are on holidays or out sick, I come and I do their shifts. And by doing that, um, I felt that I was able to learn all these skills. And then when I went into college, I'd learn all the theory for it. Like I know how to put it in, like there's some things I, I wouldn't have learned on placement that my friends would have learned. Like some of them know how to do an intervention plan from their placement, but I didn't. But when I was in college then, I learned it. And then when I was on my next placement, I was looking at their care plans. I understood the care plans because I had covered it in class. Um, so re it, there's a huge link in it. And like it can be from things like we did cooking inside, we did home management where we learned how to cook, you know, and balance out meals. We'd, and things like diabetes and obesity and all those things that you come across in a residential center. Um, and then you have your, I don't know what it's called now, it's basically like um, adapted physical education yeah, yeah. and you go in and you learn how to adapt activities for people with their dis different disabilities. But like it even applies to teenagers and you know, because you don't have to adapt things for teenagers, you might be adapting it to make it harder, it doesn't always have to be easier. Um, so all these skills that I had inside in college and economics as well, which Tom had taught me, like so important for like all the budgeting, like when you're inside a residential place because they have a fund and you just have to make sure all the money's there and <laughs> things like that, so. Brilliant, yeah. uh, that, that's a very good, uh, really good integration of theory to practice. You're, you're certainly linking theory to practice and then practice the theory and you're, you're gathering them all. And Con Conrad, you're, you're you're kind of a veteran at this stage, I think, of the uh, not not being ages now or anything, but uh, uh, in terms of your life experience, and how do you find community development and working from a community development point of view in your in your field, and you know the benefits of having that kind of ethos of community development to actually underlie the work working with LGBTQIA or other groups. I suppose like our course was very good as well, because as well the placement for us. I don't know if it's the same for you, we had placement every week throughout the year. It wasn't block placement, so you had more of a chance to put the practice into theory. Um, and as well then, you're not just going there for like two months and working on small things. You're there for the like duration of the year. So you can see how different things you're working in can evolve and how they turn out at the end. And it, is, it gives you a chance to kind of get to know the organization and know the staff and different things like that. I did mine in the gay project for two years. I think I'm the only person who did two years in the same place. <laughs> um, yeah. And we kind of looked at different programs for like healthy eating and kind of different things around coming out and different kind of supports and things for LGBT people. And then my final placement, I did it in Balvian Community Development Project. 
So that was completely different altogether. I ended up working on like a biodiversity project, going out auditing trees to see how <laughs> tall they are, how old they are, how much CO2 they secrete and all this stuff. And so that kind of gave me a broader sense then of community development as well. Um, you now I think it's good to get involved with different kind of organizations and learn about different parts of community development yeah, um, yeah, and just yeah. to really get a good experience behind you. What would you say uh, if you were to uh, ask about the, the kind of atmosphere? I know, I know we're, in a, we're in a kind of a difficult situation scenario here with, you know, partial return to campus, but going back to your years before COVID, um, what would you have to say about the, the kind of learning community and the spirit of CIT or the camaraderie, the fellow students, the, the gaff as it is? <laughs> um, CIT was amazing when I was there. Um, I was heavily involved in societies and students' union, and I think that's really important if you're coming into college because it gives you a sense of community, gives you something to kind of, you're not going to get along with everyone in your class. You're going to have different personalities, and there's always like different societies then you can join that you can get involved with, that people have the same interests as you. It gives you something to look forward to every week. It's kind of a break then as well from the hectic study schedule. Um, but as well with the community development course, we do. Uh, some of our classes in the community. So when I was here, we had a class, we had one day a week up in Nakanheeni. So that you're working in a community that's working on community development and with disadvantaged areas and stuff. Um, so you really get a good kind of practical sense of where you're going to end up working. And Kate, I know you've been heavily involved in activities. And uh, you were always involved in class reps, and I remember you getting the, the heating fixed over in T101 when you were in second year and advocating for the students. Um, how would you describe the learning community and the, the students and the, the relationships with staff and the subjects and the whole kit and caboodle out here? Um, for me, I didn't have a whole lot to do with societies like Conrad did. Um, although when I was in first year, we did try to set up a social care society. Um, but the thing is, because unlike Conrad, we've actually block placements. Yeah. So, like, the first years generally go out in November. Um, no, sorry, ja February. January, January, yeah. January February. Yeah. Uh, second years go out in November, and the third year is October, I think. Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure I didn't Wrong go. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it was very hard to heat that up, that society, so kind of fell away when we went into second year. So a lot of my relationships were built through being a class rep. Um, this is my third year being a class rep because um, I continued on to do my honours degree in social care. So I'm doing my level eight. Um, so I was basically the link between the students and the faculty. So if there was an issue uh, that assignments were too close or there's problems with the room like the heating, um, I was able to go to whoever and rather than having because I think there was about 70 in my year when we first started so instead of 70 people going off to one lecturer saying that oh we have this many assignments that the one person will go and communicate that to the lecturer so the lecturer isn't overwhelmed yeah. you're not overwhelmed and you know that the pressure isn't just on you know would you consider it an enjoyable place to study or uh, uh, CIT as a college in general or in terms of camaraderie or atmosphere or or, or do you have anything to compare it to, you know, in, in terms of the the day to, the social life? I mean, and this goes for Conrad as well. It's probably, you know, there's, there's a bit of work and there's a bit of play. I mean, how does how does it balance is the kind of question I'm asking, really. Um, from my experience, because obviously I wasn't here for my third year because I was online. So I was here on campus for about a year and a half, roughly. And majority of our time in first year was spent up that stairs inside in the common room like every first year because there was couches so you could go for a quick nap if you really needed to and then like there'd be people just wanting to play pool up there so then you kind of got to know other people by wanting to play pool up there really and then every so often you'd actually see other societies up there as well like um wanting you know playing their stuff up there I don't know I didn't really kind of take much notice of them but there was a pool table and things like that up there so that's where we did a lot of our social stuff and because we were one bus into town so what we do is sometimes that you know if we had big gaps or something we'd walk down to Wilton or we'd go up there and it was actually really re it's actually really great when you're with your friends you know and then you have the library too if none of your friends are around to get your assignments done during the big hour gaps. <laughs> And what about your future, lads? Uh, what are you up to? Will I start there? Or I'll turn back to Conrad there. 
So I, during the pandemic, started a master's in UCC in voluntary and community sector management. And as well, I did the Creativity and Change Special Purpose Level 9 in Crawford, which is also part of MTU. Um, so that was one year online as well. And I'm just going into the final year now of the Masters. So I think our dis dissertation is due in September next year. So bogged down with assignments at and the you moment. And do you think the um, programme here gave it a good uh, grounding for that, pro that Masters? Did, yeah. I think between this programme and the kind of volunteer work I do outside as well, it all kind yeah. of helped. Typically, you wouldn't be able to skip from a level seven into a master's, yeah. but because we had the constant work experience yeah. throughout as well with all the experience, then we were able to skip forward. Yes, what, what would you, uh, what would you, what, what do you and your friends tend to do when you finish social care? Do you spend five years working and then go off and do a postgrad, or, or what do a lot of you do? Do you, do you go on and do postgrad straight after? What, what's, what's going on in the class? What are the plans in year four at the moment? Um, as far as I know, most of us after this year are actually going straight out to the sector and working. Um, like, it's not a requirement at all to get a master's in social care. It's not, you don't even have to do your level 8 in social care at all. Like, if you want to go into management within about five years, the level 8 is advised. And you do contract law and things like that in your, your, year, your year four. So that if you always wanted to, if you really wanted, you could branch out even to HR, I kind of suppose. Um, but for me personally, I plan on doing my master's up in Sligo IT doing social injustice, which I realised I did I never thought about doing anything like that, but it was literally from my experience in MTU being a class rep, I realised I actually enjoy doing advocacy and I like, you know, being able to go out and be like, This is not on, like you need to you need to cop on here now and you know, I just have the personality to be able to go do that so it'd be a way I think it'd be a waste if I didn't go and do something like that so but for the masters I wanted to do it's two years but I'm sure I think CIT have one that's you can go directly into yeah straight after the the level eight yeah there, yeah I just I just add to that I mean again there's I just want to get the point across this but just to wrap up there's an awful lot of work um paid employment in the sector and the pay is, is quite decent. I mean, it's, you know, for starting salaries, you know, the hourly rates are quite good. Um, they they, they kind of dipped a bit during the, the austerity era, during, you know, we, which they did in all jobs. But the, I did a survey on it actually only last summer, and I, I think like many people working as professional social care workers, just even starting, would be getting in around 16 euros to 18 euros an hour. And there's, and there's plenty of work there as well. Now, some, you, you do start off on short-term contracts and all that kind of stuff, which is kind of the norm in, in most jobs. But So a lot of social care workers will go straight into work. Um, a lot of them work during college because there's, there's a shortage of workers. So uh, social care workers are, are always able there and across, and CIT prides itself in, in having that big link with the labour market and people being able to study and actually earn some money as well not alone after college, but as they go through college. Now, we, we don't advocate going too far with that either because we don't want it to interfere with your studies, but a, proper, a healthy balance is, is usually a good thing. Um, also, I just, just speaking from writing references for students for many years, I'm around this place for 20 years, um, and I've, uh, pr prior to becoming head of department, I coordinated uh, the honours degree year, uh, so I, I'd, have, I'd have taught all the students right through first year, second year, third year, fourth year, I'd have taught them a social care practice in year four and um, in changing models and a bit of economics in first year and, and various other things. Um, a lot of our students who want to go on and do postgraduate study actually, wait, well, that's the point I was just, I'm just returning to in the PowerPoint, go on and do, uh, can actually, once they get their honours degree, particularly once you get a, a second class honours degree and better again a 2-1, which is 60, which is not hugely difficult to get, really, it's, it, it's well attainable. But I've written references for students who've went on and become occupational therapists up in where they've gone to UL to do it. They, um, they've be, I've, I've, I've written references for students who went off and become, got masters in social work, speech and masters in speech and language therapy, um, and various other programs. So it, and many of them actually as well uh, have actually got, it's actually useful. Uh, it doesn't get you straight in by any manner of means, but it's a useful course 
for, for entering on Garda Shikana, it's, it's, it's recognised as a kind of a very useful tool, for, particularly for community policing. So it, it's a very useful, um, and if you wanted to get in the, in the other, there's other master's programmes as well, and it's a very useful um, degree to have in terms of opening up options and also giving you the ability to earn money along the way. Um, and there's, there's, there's a, a great demand for social care workers out there. And, it's for, and ge generally, the job satisfaction is good. It can be a bit heavy at times if you do too much work, too many hours, as it can for any job. But it's generally, uh, you know, generally um, a good bet, really, I, I would say. But I, would, I know I'm, I'll be obviously accused of being biased because I'm the head of the department, but I would say for people, it is, a good, it is a good bet in terms of career prospects and other opportunities and branching out and whatever. So I think we leave it at that, if that's all right. Thank you very much. My name is David Kinney, and I'm a Fortune Mechanical Engineering student and scholarship recipient in MTU. I recently competed in the Tokyo Olympics and won silver in the European Championships. The sports department in MTU is a fantastic asset to all aspiring athletes and played a huge role in my road to Tokyo. What I like most about societies is how you can meet a lot of great new people with shared interests. In MTU there's a lot of great societies, whether you're interested in film, art, dance, music, there's kind of something for everyone. They're all student-led and they're all a lot of great fun. The campus is unbelievable. The new sports centre is top notch. The facilities are really great. The gym is unbelievable and the people that work there are really nice as well. I love societies as it is an excellent creative outlet. It always encourages us to think outside the box and come up with something new. It is a great learning experience. I joined Rugby Club in MTU because it's something that my family have always been interested in and it's something I never took up. It gives you a distraction. You can work on your fitness and you can just relax after it. You, the social activity is brilliant, the amount of people you get to meet, people in different courses. It's good crack, like, you know, and you get a lot of fitness and you make friends for life, really. Yeah, just societies overall have been nothing but great. The amount of friends that I've made, the new connections that I've made, some of them I would say are definitely lifelong friends. I don't know, it's a very joyous experience. Oh, I would say 100% come here. The people are amazing and the staff, everyone is so friendly and helpful. It's the best. <laughs>